ready to go. All right. Uh, well, I would like to call the Finance and Performance Management Committee meeting to order for November 18, 2015. And the time is 9 a.m. First item we have on the agenda is uh, public comment. Any members from the public? I would like to speak. And it looks pretty sparse. Okay, hearing none, uh, we will move on to the first action item, which is the meeting minutes from October 21st, 2015. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion carries. Next item is the outsourced bus shelter installation, and I believe Mr. Henry, you're up. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, the facilities maintenance department, part of the maintenance division, is uh, tasked with the system-wide installation of bus shelters and other amenities. Uh, in preparation for the 36 shelters, which are new, uh, to be delivered within the coming weeks, and also for the removal of the shelters from Williams Park, uh, we issued a uh, bid solicitation to bring on outside, an outside contractor to assist us with those tasks. Uh, service Builders was selected, and $375,000 over the next five years is being requested to provide installation services on an as-needed basis to help augment our existing facility staff. Uh, the $375,000 would be 100% funded using federal Questions for Henry? So these, this would be used to uh, augment our, our staff when we have higher demand yes, for, I think this is a great idea. Yeah, I, I, w I would agree. That's one of the common themes we hear in public comment is not enough bus shelters. Yeah. The, um, the ones that are coming out of Williams Park, will they be reused or are they being scrapped? They've served their yeah. purpose. Although there was a suggestion at our track meeting last night by our homeless advocate, GW Roll, to uh, put that in some other location. I think he put a shelter some in. Or maybe he said that he, he said that uh, homeless people at the park um, use them during uh, rain. They, they run into the shelter. They wondered if they could have one somewhere else. Definitely look into that. That's you probably donate them to them, could you? Well, if they're going to be scrapped. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're going to scrap, obviously, the ones that are not reusable. Yeah, but right. But if there are some, well, unless they could be donated to uh, Tidbits and Falls to yeah. their courtyard. <coughs> Any other questions on this item? Mm -hmm. I move uh, the, uh, the Finance Committee recommend to the board the adoption of the proposed bill. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Okay, great. Motion carries. Thank you, Henry. Thank you. All right. Uh, the next item is um, Debbie. All right. Clever devices. Good morning. Good morning. morning. Committee. My name is Deborah Woodward. I'm the director of IT. And I'm coming to you this morning asking for recommendation to approve a one year support agreement for clever devices with a cost of a monthly fee of $245,517. This support agreement is for uh, primarily for a real bus information system. It also supports our ADL candidates. As you all know, our bus and bus information system has been very uh, supported and accepted by our writers, and this allows us to continue offering the same service to them. Uh, it is part of the original contract that we had with Clever Devices to install and uh, put the equipment in. This is the second year of the support. We were actually able to go back and renegotiate some costs with them during that process. Uh, the agreement itself is supporting three major components. It is supporting the software, it is supporting 
supporting database and uh, quality assurance, and it also offers um, on-site uh, engineer support. Uh, unless there's any questions, I just ask you to please approve this as a recommendation to the board. Again, this summer device is for one year with an update fee, $245,000. Motion and a second. Uh, any other further discussion? All those in favor? All right. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Motion carries. Okay. Now, Mr. Lenz, you're up. Uh, automatic vehicle monitoring. Thanks, David. Morning, everyone. Morning, Walt. Again, Walt Lenz. Um, I work with special projects at PSTA. I'm here this morning to ask your approval to recommend a upgrade to our automatic vehicle monitoring system which uh, you'll hear me use the acronym ABM, um, to move from an ABM 2 version to a 3 version at a cost not to exceed $240,363, give or take a penny. Um, what I, would, what I'm, I plan on doing here is a very brief PowerPoint to kind of give you a sense of what an automatic vehicle monitoring system um, includes. So um, into the PowerPoint. Right now, automatic vehicle, um, automatic an ABM system is part of our Clever Devices product. It came on board in 2010 when we um, signed the agreement with Clever Devices. It gives us basic vehicle information that our maintenance staff has been using, and been using pretty well, um, to, to record different type of fault codes that come from buses. It is, as the buses come into the yard, it downloads that information to the system every night. We do have a current ABM system, as I mentioned before, it came on with 2010, but it's really come to the end of its useful life for several reasons. And uh, along with the fact that it does not actively or automatically monitor or alert, and when the bus comes in tonight, we have to manually pull reports from the bus. But it also sits on an XP system, which is no longer supported by Clutter Devices nor Microsoft. So we're maintaining an XP system in-house right now just to keep this up and running because it is a useful tool for us. So we're, we, we're you know, that's, uh, that's why we're maintaining an XP system. And it has very limited parameters. There's really not a lot we can do with this uh, ABM2 product. So our desire is to move forward and, and with this upgrade. What does this offer us other than the fact it's going to be moved off to an XP system? Well, it offers us many features. It will give us real-time monitoring while busting and revenue service, and I'll speak a little bit more to that. It, uh, it can allow, again, um, from real time, maintenance personnel can remote diagnostically into a vehicle while it's in revenue service. It gives us different configurations. It also and, uh, gives us system generator work orders, which is very desirable. We can interface that with our fleet net work order system so that when the bus comes in and it, it reports bulk codes, it will generate an actual work order. So we're pretty excited about that. It is web-based. Um, which our current system is not. So with a web-based system, you have, it's much more user-friendly um, and, and for the average user. This is just an example of what they call a dashboard. And, and as I go to a different slides, um, you'll see a little bit of how it, the default page, and what you do here is you drill down into this, and it offers, this is a specific bus. So as you drill into this, and you can drill way more in, in depth into this type of uh, this vehicle like it's demonstrated here. You get all the statistical information. It tells you all the different fault codes on a duty cycle, and we can configure a duty cycle. That's usually a time frame on how long the bus is going to report these particular faults. So this is, again, one, one screenshot, one example of how you can monitor a bus, both in real time and when it comes back and reports any type of fault. Uh, what you're seeing here is an example of an actual real-time monitoring system. So this bus, this screenshot shows you an example of a bus operator calls in and says, hey, I have an indicator fault light. We can remote in through our cellular network for our clutter devices. We can actually remote into this bus and do an analysis and see an example here is temperature. It's uh, engine coolant temperature. And we can look at that and see exactly what type of uh, problems you're having on the engine coolant side. So a lot of times, um, this will, the driver will pull, call in and report a fault code, they will remote in and they'll make the decision if we need to go on 
get this bus before it breaks down, or now you're really good to go. Maybe we have just a faulty indicator light. So this is this is a this, again this is an example of a real time uh, remote in using the AVM3, and then it's called AVM on demand. It actually builds on top of the AVM3 product. This is this is very interesting, um, and, and and Henry really is excited about this because what this does, AVM3 now, it automatically generates statistical information. And it breaks it down by bus types, by fault codes, how long these fault codes have been going down, be going on. And you and this is this screenshot right here is just a pie chart, but you can actually drill down into that and get back to, as I showed you on this screenshot, and need to drill down a little bit further and get specific information. So it gives you, without any effort on us to pull this information, it gives you statistical information on all different bus types, regardless of what they are, be they hybrid, be they diesel or electric. So that would, you would run that on each bus? This is, well, yes, you can. And you can drill down to, this is a fleet snapshot right here. It's okay. giving you statistical. You can drill down into particular buses, particular fault codes. The data dictionary on this thing is very complex. One of the, one of the biggest struggles we have on this is defining that data dictionary. It takes a lot of work, so we can get this set up the way we want. So if you have that, and then you, you have that on a bus, then you can go back to these other things? Yes. And we can actually, um, again, actually, without walking away from your workstation, and this, without walking away from your workstation, you can pull this information via bus or statistical. This what you're looking at here. This is a um, they call this a tile screenshot. So just visualize a monitor in our maintenance area, which uh, what's our current size now? 210. 210. Actually, 210 of these tiles on a monitor, and when you look up at them, they're, they're defined by different colors. So you would see green, yellow, and red, for example. So you can look up and see a quick snapshot, and this is configurable. Um, and you would look up and say, well, in the example maybe of uh, 4779, we have a red fault code. We may want to stop this bus from going out of the yard. So it is a very good visualization. And that's what's nice about this web-based program. It gives you a good visual visualization of what's going on with the fleet. Uh, we have a couple case studies here. There's a lot of properties that are using this right now. We have Lamada. We have uh, uh, in, uh, Denver are using it. Plus uh, Chicago Transit Authority using it. Uh, we have Lynx that has it. Sacramento's using it. So we do have a lot of properties that are currently using this uh, system. And again, this just gives you a couple case studies, which um, is in the PowerPoint profit you have. So we fill that the investment for this product is well worth, especially where PSTA is attempting to go with extending the useful life of our vehicles. As some of you may know, buses right now have a lot of technologies on them. And buses are speaking to systems saying, hey, I have these fault codes, will you listen to me? And this type of software is what's being developed that will actually go in and listen to these buses and report these types of faults. What's nice about the AVM3 product is other vendors, such as Cummings as an example, they're building on top of this. Cummings is working with Clever Devices to develop a licensed interface that when you get a Cummings fault code, you can actually drill into that, pull up the Cummings information, get into their library, real time or on site, do an analysis, and in some instances actually reset the fault code without ever leaving your workstation. Now obviously, there's always a need for mechanics to go work on a bus. We're never saying that, but the technologies of a bus are, there's, a lot of this stuff can be analyzed and fixed remotely. So we feel that this, uh, this request is $240,363. When you look at what it can prevent, both on revenue service and possibly catastrophic failures, we think it's well worth the investment, and we're asking the Finance Committee to move forward and approve this. Questions? Questions? So, the benefits of this, the savings of this, are a bus would not break down during the new service. That is the intent. Now, am I going to tell you that's never going to happen? No, I will not tell you that. But that's the, what we're doing is we're going from a reactive to a proactive study. Okay. The idea is to prevent these type of mechanical failures, and this is the software that will help us do that. And with our infrequent service of most routes, that missing or a bus breaking down creates real problems for our customers who are scheduled to go to a job and right. are expecting a, a bus 
proud to be there when we schedule it. The other potential savings that we think is that you may be able to detect failures sooner so that it is not as expensive to do yes. replace the engine or yeah and, and that's why I meant about avoid the catastrophic failure. If you if you go back to the screenshot that gives you the statistical information that is an after fact, obviously, but if you look at that information, you can see that you have a problem bus that has a problem fault code that's going on for quite a while. So you look at that information, and that will allow you to take preventive action. Along with that, there's redundancy built in because the system's going to keep nagging you. It's going to say, I got a problem here. Will you take a look at it and will you fix it? It's not going to let you go. And for the maintenance folks down at their workstations, they're going to get this information. So it's going to behoove them to go out and solve the problem. But uh, the, the thing that really got us excited along with that is the actual ABM on demand, where you can actually get that bus and revenue service. Like I said, the driver says, I got an overheated engine or I got a fault code. They remote in and they say, all is good to go, continue on. No interruption in service. Currently, we have to go out, stop that bus, send maintenance guys out to look at it or pull it out of service. So this is, this is what's exciting about this stuff. And we track our uh, miles per road call. So that's, we have a measure. Yes, we do. That's measurable. And uh, our desire is to take that number down. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, miles on road call. We want to take the miles up. Yeah, I always get that one mixed up. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want to take it down. We want to take it up. Sorry. Yeah. Great. I think this is a wonderful program, and I do to recommend it. Um, how many uh, systems is this, should, is this monitor? Uh, you want uh, the, uh, right now, a new bus has over 26 computer systems on it. It monitors everything from engines, transmissions, brakes, you name it. So what it can monitor is exactly what we tell it to. We can make it mile to while. So, <laughs> so anything we want to do. And it, like I said, today's modern buses are just as sophisticated as the computer systems that we use at our workstations. So we, in order for us to be in tune and monitor these buses and do a health check, this, this is the type of software that we need to help us out. Okay, and there's nothing that's missing. Uh, the software that we're proposing? Yeah. No, this represents the latest and greatest, and in the future, uh, it is possible and it's looking very good that we're going to be able to remote and speak to the bus remotely to find out what's wrong with it. I'll second. All right, thank you. Um, I actually do have a couple of questions. Okay. Um, so this isn't replacing FleetNet, right? This is going to sit kind of on the side, the FleetNet, and integrate with FleetNet? Yes. Okay. All right. And it's going to automatically generate work orders in FleetNet? Yes. That's, that's what we're going to move forward to is to have that okay. interface with FleetNet and push out those that's good. Um, so the last system we bought in 2010, and so it lasted more or less about five years. What's the life expectancy of five years in this one? So is this is this a, a one-time cost for five years, or are there going to be every year's going to be annual? Is part of the support agreements that Deborah brings to you every year? This will be included. It'll be. So this year we're low. It'll be a little bit more. Well, and what, what we also include in this, and I didn't break it out, is um, because we have some experience with the ABM2 right now, we've actually uh, purchased off them an additional year of optimization. We've learned over time that the data, the data dictionary is so complex that when we think we have it fixed, we go back and say, eh, we wish we would have done this. So we got them to really bring down the first year optimization because I know from experience that that's where we'll go. So that's included in the price. Okay, great. And then one last question, um, and this is probably more for, for Henry. Is this um, how compatible is this going to be with the with the older equipment? Are we going to be getting yeah, the same kind of data? Compatible with all our requirements, including it will be just so you know it will be with clutter devices just like all of our onboard technologies. Once we do a new bus procurement, this system will be on. Great. Okay. All right. Any further questions? Okay. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Well. That thing that he said about the Cummins uh, inter interface, it'll just all code will come up on a bus and they'll send an invoice 
right to finance department. What we use the money comes back in the yard. Part of the order. FedEx overnight. Boom. Right. Real time inventory. Right. 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 Water. Right. Yeah, it's kind of very exciting stuff, and we're glad that you've got it. Yeah, it is. It is cool technology. Part of the bench with That's right. All right, uh, Ms. Woodward, you're, you're up again. Yeah, me again. Yeah. All right, great. Um, this is actually a two-part recommendation for approval. first part is uh, to recommend moving forward with collaborative solutions to uh, purchase and install new AV equipment. And this is relationship to uh, all of our AV equipment, including this room, primarily to the boardroom, which uh, has been in place now since we built this facility in 2005. So knock on wood. Next month, we don't have any problems. Uh, this has been in place for over 10 years, so it's definitely exceeded its life expectancy. The new system um, is actually going to be replacing cameras, some of the controls in the back of the room, displays, the monitors that are sitting at the front in the boardroom, uh, switching equipment, microphones, it includes a queuing system, and of course, the recording system itself. Uh, I was asking for a recommendation of a not to exceed $200,000. Part B is recommending to the board to move forward with a one-year agreement with four additional one-year renewals with Renicus. Um, this is for what they call peak agenda management software and iLegislate, which is a voting software. So you as a board member, as you're sitting at your spot at, at the dais, uh, will, will be able to get the latest and greatest agenda to the board, and you will also uh, be able to vote right off your iPad or Android. This technology is uh, currently used by Pinellas County in Sarasota. We actually looked at a number of different municipalities when we uh, were out there looking to see what was available in the market. And this seemed to meet, meet, meet the needs of PSTA the best. Uh, we are piggybacking off a St. John's County School Board uh, contract for the purchase of the equipment. And uh, again, the, the first part of this is to approve recommendations to the board to approve and not to exceed contract Collaborative solutions for $200,000. And the second part of that part B is to recommend approval for a one year agreement with four additional renewals with Granicus with an object to cost of uh, $70,000. Question? Yes. So, this is the, I think we use Granicus in the city of Eden Waterloo. It also <laughs> provides the, the archiving of the video. Currently, we are only buying this piece of it, but to your point, Bill, yes, there are a lot more modules that come with it. And as the county moves forward, it's good for them and for us because we get to see what they're doing as far as utilizing those modules. And if it works for us, then again, yes, we will consider piggybacking off of our hands. And is the voting similar to what St. Pete does? You have your, your device, and you, it actually brings up the screen, which I do have. And at that point, you just push the button of what you want to do, yes, no, or additional questions. And uh, it'll go into Rachel's desk at her, wait, Rachel's little station, and she'll be able to see who is voted who is not voted. So, and, and it goes up, uh, at least what I saw the county's version. It also goes up on the screen. It's and and the chair. Yeah. The chair has a Thank you, different Yeah, they have visual, a slightly different display. So they see all those folks. I know you really can't see this, but um, this should be the board members, and there, there's where the voting will come up. You'll be able to see, Reggie was able to see, and the chair was able to see who was voting. And then if you want to, if you want to make a comment, um, you can also press, there's another button right next yeah. to the voting. Yeah, okay, um, and the number of <laughs> And then that, that shows up in a queue <coughs> for the uh, chair. So it is a system that's currently being used, it's been tested, and uh, again, I'd like to recommend it moving forward. Speaking as the chair, when we have people that want to speak on different issues that are, this would be helpful. It's kind of hard to count all those. Well, well it, all it, 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 and the tenor of the meeting changed when we were able to announce that we're looking at something that. Yeah. People gave me a lot more <laughs> slack. <laughs> yeah. 
Sir, I have to have my laptop in order to work this. Yeah. Okay. So you just no. kind of remove you go to the go to meeting and it would pop well, up. Well, actually, okay. it is a separate app on the laptop, or excuse me, laptop, iPad, whatever yeah. you want to use. Yeah. Um, and within that, it's going to say PSTA meeting, and you just push that button and it takes you into the application itself. Okay. And at that point, you're going to have all your information as to what the agenda is. Yeah, right. I will not let you do it by yourself. And have a board meeting just to learn how to use it, right? My staff and I will, once we get trained, of course, we'll be meeting with each of you individually as your time limits to get you ready for the board. Yeah, but Janet Wong told me uh, this week that the county launched it like in June and they've had training. I'm sure it's continuous training. And their current chair, John Roney, uh, refuses to implement it. It's launched, so it's starting in January. And they're, they're going to start it with the new chair. There are some agenda items that when I'm preparing for the meeting, I'll print out and I'll bring supplemental information. So that's just a stack that then I use to. And sort of those points, you can actually make notes on your laptop or iPad or whatever you're bringing in so as a reminder to yourself of what you want to bring up as part of the discussion as well. Yeah. And it is yours, uh, in order to have the um, like presentations right in it? Yes. They will load the presentation into the file yeah. and as as they're presenting them on the dais it doesn't flip from page to page you have to flip from page to page but the document <coughs> is the same the problem is if they update the document then you may be not such a bad point right and that's the benefit of the go to meeting is because then you're you seeing what is up on the screen as the right. speaker's <coughs> We have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Thank you very much. Motion carries. Thank you, Debbie. Okay, now we're on to informational items. Uh, the other day, you're up. Reserve analysis. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this morning we're going to be talking about our reserves, and we'll be looking at it at the end of September, the end of our fiscal year. And as you recall, we've got various reserves. We've got our operating reserves that we'll be talking about. We have our self-insurance reserves. We have our capital reserves and a new reserve for post employment benefit obligations. And our capital reserves, uh, FTA requires us to be fiscally responsible, we have fiscally constrained budget. And so what that means is we have to live within our means. We'll be taking a look at each of these. Uh, it's unfortunate that uh, Commissioner Eggers is not here, but as you recall, he requested this. Yeah. Right. Um, 
and she used to, we're going to walk through the reserves and how the decisions we make in the future about our plus purchases affect those reserves. Thank you, Brad. And uh, I will say we have been very fiscally responsible over the years, and we've been able to build our reserves up. Matter of fact, for fiscal year ending uh, 15, as you recall, we had anticipated the need to use about $2.2 million of the reserves to balance our budget, when in fact we did not need to do that, and we were able to grow things a little bit more. We were able to do so with personnel savings, technology savings that we talk about, a lot of innovations, our procurement has saved us quite a bit of money since Lemma has been here. Matter of fact, for the contracts that she has signed so far, it's been well over $200,000 and about $100,000 of effective this past year. Let's take a look at each of these reserves. We have our operating reserves. And that represents two months of our operating expenses. You can see it's growing slightly as expenses have gone up. And uh, back in 2011 is when, back when we decided to increase the military and use some of the reserves towards balancing the budget to have a three-year balance plan. <coughs> we have our insurance reserve. And we are self-insured. And every year we have uh, our actuary take a look at our workers' compensation and our general liability. As you can see, in 2011, we went from having a flat $2 million in the bank to actually matching what the actuaries recommend that we set aside. That was very fiscally prudent. That was an excellent thing to do so that you don't get caught when these things happen. And you can see it has grown a bit there. And some of the reasons for that is we've had some significant liability cases. Actually, our workers' comp this year looks like it's going to be going down, which is good news. The other piece that has affected this is the Secondary Payer Medical Act. That has Medicare Act. That has been in place for a long time. But Medicare has been taking a closer look at this to control their costs. And essentially, this is to protect their interests. And so that people are not double dipping by us playing on a claim and Medicare paying on the same claim. So when we go to settle a claim, and we say we have that liability when we make the first medical payment, we then have to say we're protecting Medicare's interest in setting aside money for the future medical payments on that. And when that fund runs out, then Medicare picks it back up. The way around that is to litigate the claim, which costs money. And we've been litigating most of those claims that relate to people on Medicare or who will be on Medicare within the next 30 months of the incident. So we're going to be taking a new look at that and saying what do we really have to take uh, litigation and not to try to save some money. And as Brad says every day, safety first. And if we don't have the incident in the first place, we won't be having a claim. So we're going to be paying a lot of attention to our safety statistics as we move forward. The next uh, is our capital reserve. If you take a look, we have grown substantially over the last few years. We have been putting into our minds that we need this money for buses. We needed this for when we thought Greenlight would pass for that gap period. So again, it's very fiscally prudent to do this. And we've now set aside, um, we'll have in 16 about $20 million. We'll over that. And then we have a new reserve this year. This is for our post-employment benefit obligation, better known as OPEB. And PSPA provides retirement health care benefits pursuant to the Florida statute to all of our employees who retire. The retiree pays 100% of its medical premiums, but the rate that we are providing them is essentially a subsidy that they would have, uh, that they would be paying a higher rate than if we be part of our plan. And we are paying a higher rate because they're in our plan. But it's anticipated that active employees will have less claims than our retirees. So the Government Accounting Standards Board, GASI, came out with GASI 45 and said we have to record this and be very financially transparent. And so 
last year, we've been recording this, and it's about $1.2 million, a little over that. And the auditors have recommended that we set aside the funds. So we set aside the funds today. We've been doing it on a pay-as-you-go basis so that we don't end up down the road with the, oh my goodness, we've got all this money that we're paying out in our premiums for retirees. So this is something new, and that is, again, setting a best practice. Um, so, so this is going to be for the current fiscal year that we're in now. So and we're, all we're, future obligations. So we're building that reserve now. So we don't... We don't have 1.2 million set aside today. That's what we're or we do. Well, we will by the end of this year have the 1.2 set aside. And then is that ex what is that expected to do? It, it grows at about a couple years. hundred thousand dollars a year. Okay. And uh, again, we don't want to be caught down the road with saying I can't afford to put service on the street because we're paying all this. So setting aside money today, which is the best practice. And this is why Gatsby wanted us to have it in our financial statements and they require us to say what's unfunded. Okay. What is it that we're not unfunded? So we are now fully compliant and each year we'll grow it a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The, uh, so we are taking out of our undesignated right. reserves that we have at the present time and we're going to designate a portion of those from, for OPEF. We're not charging our p &L, if you will, All for right. this, but it's designating those funds. Because right. they're in the fund for OPEF, they will not be available to buy buses. Correct. So, right. okay. that's, if we, if we look at what's going on for Right. And, and you don't want to get to a point, though, where you say, I can't buy buses because I can't afford the health insurance. So, I guess to, to Bill's point there, are we taking this money from our... Undesignated. Okay. Which is the capital. Right. And we have, as you can see, our capital reserve mm -hmm. is continuing to grow to meet okay. the needs of the buses mm -hmm. as we go forward. And yet we're taking a look at our liabilities right. and taking the auditor's recommendation to set this aside. But the, the last slide you showed, is that after the operating reserve and after the yep. insurance reserve? Yes. So, Each and now, it, so this will take a hit for the OPEP. Well, it could be higher. If we were She's already taking it out. I've already taken it's it's okay. Okay. So each yeah. one of these, let's just go back a second. Our operating reserve will be fully funded. Right. Our insurance reserve, based on what the actuary tells us, will be fully right. funded. We've yeah. taken the right. estimate here. Our capital reserve is increasing significantly. Our OPEB is now funded. Right. And um, now we get to talk about how all of this <coughs> plays in together with the decisions we're making today in the future. So again, we've been very fiscally responsible. We've been growing our reserve. Um, in all of our scenarios that we've talked about over the months, we've been using our grant funds first to buy buses. So we've got about $26 million over the next five years that we will be putting towards buses. That's in addition to the Can't grant wait. funds that we use for maintenance. Correct. And we have, what did we say, 40%? Uh, we actually used less than that for maintenance. It's in the 30s, but we didn't, we said that we didn't want to go over about 40%. So everything else is going towards capital needs. Because that's something we can move one way or the other. Correct. And in here, you can see there's two lines here that are affecting our use of our reserves going forward. Operation. You see on the top line that when we start seeing red up there, that's when we're using our reserves to balance our budget, our operating budget. The next line is using reserves when we don't have enough grants to buy buses. 
this is a, we'll get into details of a variety of scenarios, and there's so many more we could possibly do, but this is just using the hybrid scenario. But what it's telling me is that we need to have some long-term solutions. We need to find ways to balance our operating budget so we don't have to use reserves. We need to start looking at other funding sources, alternative funding sources for our buses so that we can maintain our 210 fleet that Henry was talking about. So scenario number one, this is buying BAE hybrid buses over the next five years. And you can see that we are balanced out to 2019. We start to use our reserves in 18 and 19. And in 2020, we run out of money. And this is the hybrid buying all hybrids going forward. If, if we did that, just like we know. If we did. These are all hypothetical scenarios yeah. that we're looking at. And this assumes that nothing changes on the federal side. Correct. Yeah. This is using grant funds we feel comfortable that we know we're getting in every scenario. And the other thing that's important to point out, I have on here, we're buying 58 buses. In order to maintain our smooth down sustainable bus plan, we need to have 58 buses replaced in the next five years. The next scenario is we apply yep. for some oh, Can I ask? The assumed using expected grants, mm -hmm. is that the 5307? 5307, 5339, all the normal grants that we get for buses. That would be the formula grants. Yes. Um, those aren't the grants that are in danger. Mm. Well, the, are they in the... Uh, they're not in the... I, I, the I wouldn't say they're in... They're not in danger that I've heard. Okay. All right. <coughs> the danger really already happened is when the earmarks went away and then we lost another resource fund. There's other parts of the country that are in danger on that. I like know. New York. Or New York. They're losing a portion of that. <coughs> so, Jeff, what do you think? Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we're going to have to Just the the uh, use of reserves for buses. How do, how is well? What we up? do is I know how much how much grant funds I'll be getting in each year, approximately. So we made an assumption on the grant funds for each year, and then I take a look at I say, well, let's see, on here I've got 11.7 million dollars worth of grant funds, assuming we get the loan out. But to buy the buses I need in that year, I've got 12.5 million dollars worth of expenses going to So now I have to start pulling from reserves to meet that need. Okay. Is that a different slide than the one I have? In the package? Let me see. You made some adjustments? Oh, uh, so you take the 12. Do this uh, 2 and 2A. 2 and 2A. With the electric I pick up on I pick up on one big on my slides. Yeah, here I say the grand fund the buses are eight point six, um eleven point yeah. seven. So oh, uh, here.
where we get the grant, but we keep going with hybrid in addition to the budget process. Okay, I just, just wanted yeah. to make sure yeah. I was looking at the right page and think that. Yeah. Okay. And then 2A is we get hybrid. We're very successful in getting the loan no grant for our nine electric buses. But then the balance of this is diesel, or the cost of the diesel bus. So in this case, we are now balanced for up to the next five years of 2020. So this is the Four million dollars that we're going to have to use as a match for the Central Avenue BRT. Is that accounted for here? No, this is just the money for buses. So I've already taken that money and set it aside. So that's already set aside. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And the numbers I've got aren't matching this at all. No, the numbers I had on Monday, okay. I, I had a hiccup in my okay. shape for two A and two and two A. So under this scenario, again, we're successful in the loan up grant. We're buying all of our replacement buses that we need. Um, of course, we've already said we're buying seven hybrids for this fiscal year coming up. And the balance will be diesel or the cost thereof of the diesel. And again, we, so when do we run out of money in this scenario? In this one, we are actually balanced through the next five years. So 2021, all of this the right okay. would be right. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Barely red. It's a little pink, maybe. What? Right. Pinkish, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is red. Right because it looks like it's like using uh, so the difference nine million you know, reserves. Two and two A is hybrid. hybrid. Two A uses diesels in the out years. Instead of hybrids and okay. electrics. Yeah. But we still are just buying nine electric buses in 17 to use as our pilot. We're not right. expecting to buy any more electric buses right. in the next three years under this assumption. Right. Although, as Debbie said, um, theoretically, uh, we, under this 2A scenario, we would pay for the diesels. And if there was some new grant program or partnership to Sierra Club, suddenly you had tons of money and they gave us the money for the upgrades on the electrics, as long as we were paying 500, 500 k per bus, this right. would still work the right. same way. Right. Somebody gave us the money for the upcharge. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, but it only assumes the upcharge in the year in the loan up grant. In the one year, yeah. One year. Correct. So what if we don't get the loan no grant? And I call it my BYOB, buy your own bus with our own fifty three oh seven money and our own PSDA money. And this is where we do a pilot program of four electric buses plus the infrastructure, and we continue to buy hybrid. And in this scenario, we run out of money in 2019. So in 2018, we're good. 2019, we go in the red. And again, this is buying just a, uh, out of our own funds, plus our own 5307 money, four electric, and then the rest are hybrid. This again is a revised, there's some revisions in this from what's in the handout. Uh, yeah, there is. So again, um, the two IOB was inspired by you, Brian. That comments about paying our own way on the electrics. But we have, uh, we buy four, not nine. We buy four as a pilot, and then we keep going hybrid. We go in the hole in 2020 a little bit more than if we just stay with the hybrids. But it's pretty close to the same as scenario one. Okay. So now what happens if we don't get the loan no grant, but we still go forward with the pilot program on electrics for four buses, but we still have the diesel going forward 
or the diesel, like someone else buy, you know, pays for the differential. So now, once again, we are failing to 2020 in this scenario. So a lot of different scenarios to look at. And this just doesn't even begin to scratch the surface, but it gives you an idea. And we are continuing to look at such things as C and G and what the requirements are for the equipment on that, uh, alternatives for funding, and we are now working with various vendors on that. We're also going to take a look at the potential for cost savings of leasing batteries, because that's a technology piece that continues to improve. That might be an option. Uh, looking at other innovative financing options, and of course, finding other funding partners to help us going forward. And we will detail all kinds of options in anticipation of presenting the capital budget in April. Now, this is rather innovative. Talk about coming up with the, this is BYOB, bring your own battery. Okay. And um, this is a bus, a diesel bus that has a battery attached to it. Different term for BYOB, correct? Yeah, that's right. So are there any questions? So what you're showing us is there are different optional ways to proceed in the future years and what some of those options would be. But a really critical input for those options whether we can get the low no grant or not. Right. Or for the electric piece. Mm -hmm. Correct. And yes. I would say if looking at our future funding partner, um, we can say balance in any one of these scenarios to 2019. So it's how we want to proceed forward. And also, like I said, what will make an impact is balancing our operating budget so that we can use more funds towards capital and finding additional funding partners. I would suggest perhaps, as the scenarios show, getting or not getting a Lono grant uh, doesn't really change the timing significantly on when we go out of balance. It's still the same. It, uh, the fundamental decision is by the PSA board on future bus purchases, regardless of the Lono grant, because essentially we're paying for the, if, even if we get the Lono grant, we're paying for diesel buses and the feds are paying the incremental price. So uh, if we stay with hybrids, uh, we go uh, into a deficit in 2020. If we, if we go with diesels, we go to 2021, which is pretty much what we knew before. But uh, the other point of this presentation is supposed to, we have, this is only looking at those capital reserves. Um, we still have the operating reserve, the insurance reserve, and now the OPEP reserve separate uh, right. from that. But, but when we're making a decision on buses, we need to be looking at the bus portion of our reserve. Right. Correct. Because we can't we can't tap those other stuff. That's right. That's right. <coughs> when we look at these at these reserves out in the future, um, where do we project the millage rate to be at? When we Consistent to what we have today. Okay. So if we have another million bucks. Okay. And we've, I mean, we've escalated it each year. Right. Okay. Yeah, so the, I mean, the other, the other thing that takes away from the reserves we have available for us is, is using them for operations. The extent that we can have a balanced operating budget where we don't touch the reserves on a yearly basis, that keeps that 22 million that we have fuller right. for buses. And because these numbers assume that operating loss is growing. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And here, like this is a hybrid scenario, we take a look. We're able to actually start building things up in this year, a little bit next year but then we start using that money down for operations. So, for instance, if we did the millage increase next year, we would, or 
beginning in 18, we would flip that from a negative four to a positive six or something like that. Whatever, I can't remember what the differential was. I think it was about a minute. It was a bus year, but yeah. that's the way it out. <coughs> Two buses. I, I would recommend that we come up with a plan to address the shortage in the operations budget in future years. You know, we look out and we say, this is when we need to change our billing tree, or this is when we need to have a... Now, there's some assumptions in fair increases every three years there. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we have another fair increase in because it, you know, it's part of. I, I, I tend to think that we need to deal with the operations loss, kind of independent of the capital purchase, so we know. Because if you move one to the other, yes, we can delay buying a bus. laid out previously, which will probably be some more recommendations of the fare increases, looking at our service that we have and what makes sense in our service. Um, you know, I think, like I said, we're coming up with many ways of saving money from a staff perspective, and we have to continue to be innovative and do that. This so, and the ad norm must be on the table. And the STP is also. STP, that's our new funding partner. This is going to be a new part of this, just to all the things we've right. said. So. But, but it's good to, I think it's good to kind of look at this every, day, every couple of months just so we can better now have a plan to change it. Yeah, and like you said, I mean, uh, we did present a plan that had a longer term balanced operating budget, but we eliminated more rounds than we actually ended up doing, and we, um, at one point had the ad valorem going to point seven five. So I think as you say, getting this in front of the board earlier in advance of May when the capital program is approved, so that there's a better understanding of you know so the balance between the long term fiscal health and uh, whatever decisions we have to make. I'm just, just saying so that if we do do the extras and go to 0.75, then right away we're, we're making it so that when we get to 2020, we're going to be in a lot better shape. We have two or three thousand. Yeah. Good. 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 The issue I have kind of with that is taxing now for later when I'm not, I don't like to move kind of the reverse of the pay later for now, yeah. which is what we were doing on the OPEP, for instance. I agree, but I'm just thinking if we pay, if we plan on paying that later, and where are we going to get the money? If we, if we pay it now, then we, then we've got it. When we're, when we're using it. Yeah, it's kind of generational cost shifting in reverse. <laughs> <coughs> All right. Well, I'm sure that'll be a robust but it is. discussion. <laughs> <laughs> but I think this is very be before your next meeting, um, Congress will decide on this uh, their new transportation bill, and we'll know whether New York won or the rest of the country won on the bus money. So that'll change. That just changes the formula allocation. All right. So taking yeah. the high density money that went to high density areas and reallocating it to the rest of the country. And your assumption is whatever it was last year. Your no idea. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other questions? I I just ask that the this be the new device numbers be distributed. Yes, please. Yes. Or be a data bill to us. I just I just email it to you. Thank you, Dad. I have one question. You know, we, we said, you mentioned it, Bill. 
Operating impact going forward and the bus impact going forward. And yes, we can switch from one to the other, but that gets confusing. To my simple mind. Well, that's true. I mean, I mean we could um, take that first line, the, the projected use of reserves to uh, balance operations take that out of the, what we're calling the capital reserve, um, set it aside is something, I can't call it operating reserve, uh, real for operating for reserve. The region for future operating costs. Future, yeah. The density is the same in all the cases. It does. It does. Yeah. It does. Yeah. In the scenario that we yeah.
and anticipation of this. Again, this is missing the actuarial report for our workers' comp and liability and our OPEP. Um, and right now, without those in there, as you take a look at the month of September, which is usually when those entries were hit, um, we had a budget of four million and we came in with a deficit and we came in with a deficit of 3.3 million or $793,000 positive variance. And I'm gonna have Michael talk uh, for a minute here. We, we're changing how we're doing some of our accounting. It doesn't change the bottom line, but it's going to present, I think, a better, more accurate picture of our financial statement. So I'll let Michael uh, talk a little bit how we're looking at passenger fare. Yeah. In the past, um, the dark copays that were paid directly to the provider uh, were reported as a reduction of expense um, instead of as passenger fares. And we feel that they're better reported as passenger fares. Um, so I think, I think the adjustment was a little over $800,000. Coming under budget, it's probably easier to take a look at the next page on page 43 on a year-to-date basis. As I mentioned, we've um, we anticipating using reserves, and in fact, we do not need to use reserves. And our budget uh, through the end of the year was a 2.2 million dollar deficit, which would have been funded by pulling from the reserves. But in fact, at this point in time, we're just about right on budget. And so that helps us out significantly to keep the money towards operations and towards buses. Uh, we've talked about all year passenger revenue has been down, and we've looked at uh, reasons for that, as well as our uh, fringe benefits, as well as our personal expenses, are large contributors to us being under budget. What is subrogation? Subrogation is when we, we get money back on third party claims. That's, that, so that applies to services and insurance? Uh, two different things. On the recoveries, we get money back from our insurance carriers when we exceed our self-insured protection limit. The service expenses is 5.4% under budget to be increased subrogation. Yeah, and the maintenance cost, when we go to fix a bus because someone has hit it, we incur the cost. And then we go after the third party to repay us, so we're giving back to that same line for expenses too. Yeah, I thought we that keep it was, I thought that was the area. insurance expenses. The insurance expenses would be the recovery from the insurance carrier. Now our own insurance carrier. Am I saying that right, Diane? <laughs> <laughs> the subrogation is when we get the money recovery from like the third party. And that goes back to maintenance because it's where they incur the expenses. And then the recoveries are from our insurance carrier. And then the passenger fare revenue, is that partly because of all of the discounts and things we have? Which one was the, we, we talked about the TV that was one of the contributing factors. Mm -hmm. And of course we increased the TV fare this year and we saw such a huge increase in the riders for that. So hopefully when we get into next yeah. year that won't be there. And the cancellation of new services? That was, we had anticipated a million dollars worth of new service this year, expansion service. So that was something we could control and we could not afford. That was yeah. the express route to the airport from St. Pete. year last year 
shift it. And the shifts in the actuarial reports, which I am anticipating for general liability based on initial drafts, will probably be somewhere around 500,000. And the reason for that is, and we've just gotten our first draft on that, and that's for what they call IBNR, improved but not reported. And the actuary takes a look and says, you know, where have things been settling at? Again, that plays into some of the, the secondary Medicare act that they're now ratcheting down on. So he's going to say set aside more money than you have been in the past in anticipation of that. And then we just look, we look at it every year. That won't be cash out the door, but it certainly ties up the expense side as well as the liability. Yeah, tied up with Right.
And then down in the bottom, the complaints per 100,000 passengers, we now break that up between bus and dark. Is that new this, that's new this year, right? Right. That is new. And the, and the dark is... Uh, we probably don't want to do that in 100,000 passengers. <laughs> um, since DART only carries 300,000 passengers in the whole year. Um, although maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's intuitive to have it in the same ratio. Um, yeah, I, I just, I had asked that it be reported because sometimes we, yeah. we seem to see some variation on the back page, the graph is, that's just bus complaints on the graph. The other thing that I could, it, to me, it would be nice to have the call wait time on the same summary sheet rather than having it separate in the board package. Yeah, do that. The other thing, Vivian Peters, who is not hesitate, hesitant to let us know when her expectations are not met, um, was talking, I think, at the last board meeting about the cleanliness or the, the just upkeep around bus stops and shelters and, and the, the appearance of the buses. have any way of, we have measurements on those? Is that something we need to consider? Or? I know when I've gone out to bus stops. We, we have, um, of course, we track complaints about bus cleanliness. That's the only um, measure of complaints. I know of. But, um, of course, Henry, we do have a bunch of um, metrics on what we what we do, what we provide. Percentage of buses cleaned or, you know, serviced. Number of bus stops we service, that kind of thing. But as far as, like, a regular measurement of how we're doing, as far as how dirty the bus stops are, Survey. Do we do a survey. The shelters, I think mean, we're, we're terminating the people that we're using right now. Right? We're going to have a new one from people um, that came to the Right. Well, that, they started October 1st. We had a 30 day assessment review two weeks ago. Yeah. They came in, they showed us some metrics. Um, basically, they've gone out and they've touched 66% of all the shelters. Stops, power washed, mowed, cleaned, uh, picked up a lot of debris and trash. Obviously, when one contractor is being replaced by the other, there's overlap. Um, so we had to, we had quite a bit of uh, catching up to do the first uh, three weeks on, on contract takeover. I think if we averaged 25 tons of trash uh, a month, I think we picked up 45 tons in that. That's probably what she was complaining about. Yes, there was a bit of overlap there. Uh, <laughs> Brad is correct. Generally, we gauge uh, the public's response um, to help guide us as to where our trouble spots are. And I can say that uh, those have gone down. Um, in fact, uh, we're, uh, the, the, our new contractor mm -hmm. is going to be providing us with more metrics based off efficiency patterns. Um, they want to be the most efficient possible. They're going to be sharing us with that where we need to concentrate more time and where perhaps we don't need to concentrate as much time. So uh, as soon as we get this that data rolling in, that's really going to help us out. Be happy to share it. My, my experience when I'm going out riding, and I don't ride that often, but I do ride periodically, is that the, the and this is That is one.
one of the you know, that, that is one of the areas that we're, we're concentrating fully on. Obviously, with, with the new contractor, new bus shelters coming in, that being physically brand new, that that's going to help. Henry has an awesome PowerPoint, which pictures the trash. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to, I'd like to see that. But next month we are not meeting, is that correct? No, that's right. That's right. Plus, we want to change that when we come with the trash. <laughs> it, I, I do think that a, our a next meeting should address the bus maintenance uh, issue. Well, the the look, uh, yeah, but it's uh, I don't think it's infection is being passed on there, but the, the our focus on customer oriented public transit service. If if we are uh, trying to attract choice riders and they. I think they will react negatively to the current appearance. So that's you know, bring your photos in. And look. Is, it, is it is it maintenance of the buses or is it maintenance of the shelters? I'm particularly talking about the stops. Okay. And I, I would like to see how we maintain the buses in terms of cleanliness, as far as how often do they get washed, how often do they get detailed and stuff. Yeah. That's just important. Well, and this, this, this budget we just approved, the, the only new employees that we approved were two bus cleaner folks. Two, and we have, we have, Henry's got that data on how often the buses are cleaned, and now with these two new employees that increase frequency of interior cleaning of buses. Yeah. Well, uh, we got just a couple more minutes here before the next committee comes in. Um, any other questions on the front page staff? Uh, capital projects update? Um, yes, and you've got the whole package in here, and I would say probably the big item for this last quarter was the receipt of the buses and putting them into service. Are they all in service now? All in service? Yes, sir. I've seen them all. But you can well, you can tell that they're like they're just newer. They don't really look the same to the average person, but you can tell they're new. A couple of little subtle ones. That bronze look that you see on the rear side. All right, future meeting subjects. Uh, see, banking service, HVAC repair, resurface lane. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a renovation of our service lane. Okay, the fuel island. The fuel island. Okay. Chiller replacement. So we also want to uh, look at uh, cleanliness of buses yeah. and shelters. And um, I've got a question. How do we track our fuel? What kind of software do we use to track the fuel? Is it say, uh, we use a program called Watch. It's completely automated through RFID. Does that integrate with Fleet now? Yes. Uh, yeah, you, it does. Yes. Yes, it does. Does that have a? We're, we're rolling out. Um, uh, we have a fuel master. And we're, we're getting ready to roll out what's called the AIM2 system, where the uh, there's a basically what looks kind of like a hockey puck item that that uh, maps the bus. Filament where the, there's a make on the on the nozzle and the fuel pump won't turn on until they actually right. we have that kind of system. Uh, Fleet Watch does work that way, where the bus pulls into the island uh, through radio uh, frequency, it automatically detects the bus number, activates all the appropriate fluids, automatically tracks them, and then flows into our system. So very little human interaction other than to physically. So then the fuel uh, 
Um, and kind of where I'm going at is, is with that type of system, it really almost virtually eliminates the effect. Right. So is that kind of the same thing that we have? Yeah, on? we, I don't we know if that's an issue or not. Right. Well, what we do is before e each day uh, or each the following day, we make sure that we um, audit how much fuel was pumped versus how many miles traveled versus what the total very small margin of error, which is probably just due to splash off. Right. All right. So we got a good process in play. Good. All right. Anything else? No. All right. Well, should we have a motion to adjourn? No. All right. Thank you. Great job, Mr. Chairman. Thank you yeah. very much. Everybody have, have, a, have a great uh, Thanksgiving. Thank you.